What's up, guys? So, just got done replacing this evaporator coil. We're pulling a vacuum right now, but I figured what better time than now when I've got this tour apart to uh, go over our refrigeration circuit. I've had a lot of questions recently, common misconceptions uh, about the refrigeration circuit. So we're gonna go over the basics, uh, dig in a little deeper and go over some of our superheat and subcooling readings and what we're looking at there. So let me clean up some of my mess and make some room and we'll get into it. All right, so here we are. I'm sitting inside the condenser as you can see. Um, so let's start with our compressor. I got helper extraordinaire Matt here with me today, so. Um, <laughs> compressor compresses the gas. So we come out of our discharge line, high pressure. High pressure gas. High temperature gas. Mm -hmm. And then we go to our condenser coil. What's our condenser coil do? Um, rejects heat and liquefies the gas. Keep it simple, it condenses. It condenses. It does exactly what the name says. So we content, condense that high pressure, high temperature gas into a uh, high pressure, high temperature liquid. And then we come out of our liquid line here mm -hmm. as a liquid and hit our filter dryer. Our filter dryer just catches any moisture, any contaminants, anything that's in the system. We go to our liquid line and we hit our metering device. This has got fixed orifice metering device. You can see your indentions here. So this is a piston type metering device. And our metering device lowers the pressure, which lowers the boiling point of that liquid refrigerant. Mm -hmm. Liquid refrigerant is fed into our evaporator coil what does our evaporator coil do? So it takes that saturated liquid and picks up the heat from the return and boils off the liquid and you have a low pressure vapor. Low pressure, I'm sorry, low pressure, low temp vapor. Very good, yes. Keep it simple, it evaporates. <laughs> it does exactly what it says it does. So we evaporate in our evaporator and we come back, as you said, a low temperature, low pressure vapor through our suction line to our compressor. Let's uh, go a little deeper. Superheat and subcooling. Where do we read our subcooling readings at? Uh, subcool would be at your liquid port, which... That's where we would read our pressure mm -hmm. and our temperature on the liquid side because we're subcooling that refrigerant. So, and I'm gonna fumble through this too because I'm, I'm, I'm not a teacher. <laughs> but, uh, so everybody in the comments, uh, tell me what I said wrong or what we did wrong or how you teach this because this is important stuff. Um, common misconception is you see high head pressure and I hear this a lot. Well, my head pressure's up, I think I've got a restriction. Does a restriction cause high head pressure? The answer is no. A restriction, whether it be in your metering device or your liquid line dryer, is not gonna cause high head pressure. Think of it like your air conditioner at home. Most, most of us have pumped down an air conditioner. You're pumping all that refrigerant back into the condenser. But what do you do first? You shut your liquid line valve. When you're shutting that liquid line valve, you have a 100% restriction and your pressure goes down. And you're actually gonna get higher subcooling at that point. So what is our subcooling telling us? Any that, ideas? Um, that liquid is getting stacked up in my condensing coil. Correct. It's it's if the higher subcooling would tell you you're stacking liquid in your condenser. So our subcooling is actually telling us that we're turning into a liquid. It would be nice if all these tubes were clear and we could look inside and see what the refrigerant was doing. We can't. So we use our saturation temperatures. So about 80% of this coil, as we're about 80% through, I'm going to be 100% liquid. My subcooling is the extra heat that I pick up 
after I'm completely changed to a liquid. So that subcooling reading is telling me that I've completely condensed into a liquid and the extra heat I picked up is my subcooling. Most things have a subcooling rating on them. Package unit like this, not necessarily. Uh, most of them come with a, uh, a charging chart, but and they're going on approach temperature. Uh, it's not always 100% accurate because you don't always have your liquid line ports. Uh, carrier likes to put them on here, which is nice because you can check for restriction uh, across your dryer. Um, to do that without your liquid line ports, you would take a temperature drop. If you're two, three degrees drop across your liquid line dryer, you've got a restriction there. So would that be because it's like metering slightly? Yes, it basically would become your metering device. And, and that's why you'll see the lower temperature coming out of it. So our subcooling tells us we've completely changed into a liquid. And that's the extra heat we picked up because we're subcooling that liquid after it's completely changed state and we head over to our evaporator and that's where we're going to check our superheat you take your line pressure saturation temperature minus your line temperature and that tells you your superheat what's our superheat telling us whether or not we are at full vapor or partial liquid correct or, it's it's, it's or superheated or exactly well beyond our same same space. thing as our condenser it's telling us we we have to change state. That's how we cool. The, the refrigerant has to change state. Liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid. So as we're feeding our evaporator, our superheat is telling me that I have completely changed state into a vapor. And again, about 80% through the evaporator coil, I'm gonna be completely changed to a vapor. And the extra heat that I pick up on that refrigerant is telling me that's my superheat. So I've completely saturated into a vapor and I'm picking up some extra heat as I'm coming back to my compressor. We need to be checking our superheat and subcooling so we can tell what our refrigerant's doing and make sure we're feeding 100% liquid to our expansion device and we're getting some superheat back to our compressor. And that's why we need to concentrate more and it's a good uh, a good idea to concentrate more on your saturation temperature mm -hmm. rather than your actual pressure because the pressure is going to vary the pressure is just a variable in but it depends on your return air temperature your outdoor temperature all that's going to factor in if you're using something like measure quick it's going to factor in some of those numbers for you and it's going to help you that's how it calculates it, you know if you're in in the ballpark but, uh, you know, rule of thumb on your saturation temperature for your uh, condenser would be 30 degrees over ambient. And so we're just looking at our saturation temperatures here on the inside. Our pressure's obviously the, 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 the white. And then we got 410, uh, R22, and 404. And depending on your gauges, they may be different. But uh, if I'm running a saturation temperature... This is 410A, running a saturation temperature of 90, um, you know, 30 degrees less, 80, 70, 60, would be about 60 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. Rule of thumb. Like I said, you gotta go by your charging charts and everything else, but um, that's telling me that that's what my condensing temperature is. So at 260, 70, whatever PSI that is, 90 degrees is my condensing temperature. Same thing on your evaporator. If you're looking at your evaporator temperature or your your uh, saturation temperature, that's telling me that's the temperature of my evaporator. So that's common things we don't look at. Everybody wants to see pressures and you know, it used to be beer can cold and biscuit warm. We have to know what our refrigerant's doing so we can protect the heart of our system, which is this guy here. And if we start getting too low on that superheat, we will we call it flood back. We will wash out the oil and you'll tear up the compressor. It will overheat quickly. Okay, so I asked that question again. So we're on, <laughs> let's say we're, we're at R22. I hook up my, my, my pressure port and I get 68 degrees and then I get a temp line. Well, you get 68, 68 PSI. PSI that's what I get. And then I hook up my 
my temp probe and I get 50 or 55 degrees. So that was roughly 10 or 15 degrees of super heat. Correct. So, and that's where our pressure temperature correct. chart comes in handy. So my question and if is- we, If we look, uh, let's say 68 to, 68 to 70, let's look on our gauge. So if we're at, uh, we'll say 70 is a little easier to see. And that puts you right about that 40 degree mark. Mm -hmm. These aren't 100% accurate. That's why our new digital gauges work a whole lot better. But that's on your gauge and on your pressure temperature chart. That's exactly what you're, that's what it's showing you. So you would have, if you were 50 degree line, you'd have 10 degree super heat. Mm -hmm. And these are always handy to have. And the one last thing to keep in mind before you're checking all this stuff you can't really check all this stuff properly if you got a dirty condenser coil if you got a dirty evaporator coil if your filter's dirty that's going to throw your readings off because if i got a dirty filter what's happening yeah you're not getting airflow and you're not picking it's not burning off the heat restricting the air exactly i got restricted airflow or i got a loose belt i'm not completely evaporating i may have a low superheat at that point so you gotta make sure your filters are clean, your evaporator's clean, your condenser's clean before you can even start checking anything like that. Or, or you're just, you're pissing in the wind at that point. Nobody likes to piss in the wind. We're about 1200 microns. And I think that about did it. We went over most of it. Um, I don't know how this is gonna turn out guys, but uh, we had some good questions. Thanks to Matt for being a part of this. Um, we're gonna button this guy back up and start seeing if we can put this thing back together. I don't really remember how it came apart. So uh, if we don't have at least one screw left, we did something wrong. Just keep that in mind. There's always gonna be one screw left. Thanks for watching guys. Leave a comment, leave a trade better than you found it. We'll see y'all next time.